passage. First Samuel chapter eighteen. First Samuel chapter eighteen. Beginning at verse six, and we're going to read simply through verse eleven, just five verses basically. First Samuel chapter eighteen, verses six through eleven. And the King James reads, And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman, the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he, and he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? In other words, what's he lacking? You know, all he needs next is the kingdom. He might as well be king. Well, he was headed there, Saul. And Saul eyed David from that day and forward, and it came to pass on the morrow, see I'm in the Bible, on the morrow, that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand, as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So twice this happened. Twice Saul tried to take David's life. Would you pray with me? We're going to be talking this evening about the green-eyed demon. The green-eyed demon. Master, we thank you, God, for your word, for we know tonight that it is exalted above all else. Lord Jesus, as we break the bread of life, we desire tonight nourishment from heaven. We desire, God, that our soul would be fed. Lord, that we would leave this place fat, as it were, on the uh, filling and, and fulfilling word of God. Master, today, let your word speak to us as it's never spoken to us before. Help us, God, to grow. Help us, Lord, to uh, benefit from this word that you've placed in my heart for this time. God, let your anointing flow like oil, Master, through the valley. Uh, of our soul this day, and let it re refresh us, God, and revive us this hour, we pray. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God, and amen. You may be seated. The green-eyed demon. And of course, you know when I say the green-eyed demon, we're used to the phrase, the green-eyed devil, or the, the, the green-eyed monster. And that, of course, speaks of jealousy. But see, I want you to understand tonight that jealousy is a very severe, very real issue. As a matter of fact, I would dare say that the vast majority of the evil that is visited by one human being upon another is out of jealousy. It's due to jealousy. And I want you to understand today that jealousy is, is a much bigger issue than merely a human emotion. It's not about human emotion. Do you know in the Old Testament, God literally had to make a provision within the law for a man who might be overcome by the spirit of jealousy? In Numbers 5, verses 11 through 15, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, if she steps out and has an affair, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept closed, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner, and the spirit of jealousy come upon him. Now you've heard me talk about the fact that spirits are identified by the work they do. I've talked about the fact that there's a spirit of fear. I've talked about the fact there's a spirit of lust. I've talked about the fact that there are spirits of pain. There are uh, uh, all, all different kinds of spirits that attach themselves to human beings, and they work in one realm of the emotion. This is one reason why I've said that the emotional human being is very much attached to the spiritual human being. 
This is one reason why uh, I kind of laugh at those religions that believe in worshiping and they believe in uh, coming to God in prayer, but doing so in such a fashion that you basically are so quiet and so humble and, so, and you just barely are heard. Because what they don't understand is the emotional man, the emotional part of you, is actually married to the spiritual part of you. When your emotional person is hurt, your spiritual person is hurt. You know, King David, or David the psalmist said in one place, he said, but a wounded spirit, who can bear it? So when your spirit is wounded, when you're wounded right to the core of your person, that is a wound that can hurt, that is a wound that can be so grievous that it's difficult for us to come back, and it's difficult for us to find health again. Because a wounded spirit is a difficult thing. But there are spirits that do a job that is so specific to one certain area. And in this case, God is telling Moses, there is a spirit of jealousy. See, jealousy is not just what somebody feels. If somebody, you know, sometimes you say, well, he, he tends to be a jealous person. No, he doesn't tend to be a jealous person. He has a jealous spirit. He's allowed that to come into his person. I remember my grandfather and my grandmother, Belle. Here she is. She's not a beauty queen. She doesn't have a 29-inch waist anymore. And yet my grandfather still had a jealousy for her. If he thought for one second that she was looking at somebody else or somebody else was looking at her, he would get all aggravated and all upset because there was a spirit of jealousy involved. It was more than just an emotional issue. It was a spiritual issue. And that spiritual issue can only be dealt with in a spiritual manner. You have to deal with it on a spiritual level. You try to deal with a, deal with a spirit as a psychiatrist or a psychologist, you're going to accomplish nothing. This is why so oftentimes their husbands wind up killing their wives or killing their wives' boyfriends or whatever. And, it, and it's because there was a spirit involved and they might have gone to counseling and they might have spoken to somebody and talked to somebody, but they weren't addressing the real root of the matter. They were not dealing with the root uh, issue. But you see, it's interesting. Jealousy is something that has such a negative connotation. Jealousy is something that can be so destructive. And yet, at the same time, the Word of God tells us that God is a jealous God. If you look at Exodus 34, verses 12 through 14, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves, for thou shalt uh, worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous is a jealous God, whose name is Jealous. Do you know what that means when the, in the Hebrew, when they use that kind of language, and you say, my name is so-and-so, and, -so, and I, you know, my name is Love, my name is Jealous, then that means that that is so much, not so much a part of you, but that you are so much that thing that it consumes you, that you are jealousy. You're not, you're not just someone who can be jealous. You are jealousy. And that's what the word of the Lord is, is telling us. That is how much God is jealous of his church. That's how much God is jealous of his people. And he doesn't want us stepping out. This is why in the end days, God is going to destroy with a mighty hand the Roman Catholic institution because for all these years, she has been leading his people off into all kinds of directions and causing them to commit spiritual fornication with all kinds of religions and all kinds of idolatry. And God is a jealous God. He doesn't like that. He doesn't want his people in bed with the idols. He doesn't want his people in bed with the pagans. He doesn't want his people in bed with the politicians or the statesmen either. He wants them in bed with himself and nobody else. And he's a jealous God. So jealousy, we see, at the same time, it can be a very destructive, it can be a very negative thing, but then at the same time, jealousy can have a positive connotation in the right circumstances. Unfortunately, God is the perfect practitioner 
of jealousy. But we as human beings are best not to really try to dabble with it too much. Because if we try to dabble with it before too, too long, it consumes us. And it doesn't become a part of us, it overcomes us. Like with Grandpa and Grandma, I mean, I, I remember hearing him go on tirades, you know, and I think to myself, good God, man, you know, I don't think I've ever known a woman who's been more faithful to her husband than Grandma, and it's like, and, and yet he could just be so convinced that there were things going on and there, that spirit of jealousy was whispering in his ear and offering all kinds of ridiculous uh, concepts of what might have happened and why she was 20 minutes late coming home from church or why she was this late coming home from the grocery store. But you know, jealousy has played a part in biblical history. We learn a lot of lessons in Scripture from jealousy. For one, we read tonight of David and uh, Saul, and we see that after a great victory where David had played an enormous role. As they were coming home, the Bible said the women of the cities of Israel came out to greet Saul. They weren't coming out to greet David. They were come, the king. They were, they were coming out to greet their, their uh, king who had just won victory in the battle, and they were rejoicing, and they were shouting in the streets. But at the same time, they took the time to honor their premier uh, soldier, their great warrior. So while they, were, while they were crying out in honor of King Saul, Saul has slain his thousands. Yay! We're, Saul's the one we're out here to give honor to. Saul's the one we want to see. Saul's the one we're looking for. But then in the next breath they said, and David his ten thousands. Now see, they weren't comparing David and Saul. Because in the mind of the kingdom of Israel, David was at that moment in time Saul's greatest warrior. Just as the Philistines, had they won the battle, they might have gone home and said, Oh, the king has slain his thousands, and Goliath has slain ten thousands. But see, what, what David did, or what Goliath could have done but didn't, what they did was on behalf of the king, because they were in his service. So therefore, to say David has slain his thousands, I'm sorry, Saul has slain his thousands, and David is ten thousands, was not taking away anything from Saul, because everything David did fell under Saul's victory. It fell under his leadership. So, was there any reason for Saul to become jealous? No, not really. But he did. And the Bible said that an evil spirit from God came upon Saul. We like to think of that when we read that. We like to think that that means that God had an evil spirit. But that's not what it's saying. It's talking about location. Do you remember before Satan visited Job, who had he talked to first? He had to go to God to get clearance. Well, let me tell you, there's not a devil in hell come against you that doesn't have to stand before God first and receive permission from the Lord that, yes, I believe Donna can endure you, therefore I'll let you loose. Go ahead, try her. Give her a shot and see how she does. He has more confidence in us than we have in ourselves sometimes. But there was an evil spirit from the Lord, meaning that this spirit was proceeding from God, that he had, he had gone to God first, and now he was proceeding from God, and he came to Saul, and it was obviously a spirit of jealousy, because he, his ire got raised, and as uh, things were getting heated, and Saul was feeling kind of good, actually. Isn't it funny how even preachers... Even men who know what the move of God is, even people who know what the Holy Ghost is, even people who know how wonderful it is to be in the presence of God, they can still act stupid when a spirit of jealousy comes on them. One minute they can be up in the pulpit preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and in the next minute they're throwing javelins. They're trying to hurt somebody because they're jealous of the up and coming. I remember when I started my third church years ago, I loved Brother Davis 
more than I loved anybody in the world. I admired him. He and I came from similar backgrounds. He also had, had come up in the Assemblies of God. He started out as a Trinitarian preacher, and he came into the oneness truth. And I admired him. We had so much in common. I respected him. I tried to work within his church. Uh, there was really, they didn't need Sunday school teachers. They didn't need this and that. But the Lord spoke to me and said, start a radio program. So I did. Now, Brother Davis had never had a radio program. He had never uh, conducted a radio program. But I started a radio program. Well, before it was all done, uh, the radio station that I had my first program in was buying another station, and it was a Christian station. The first station was country. So what I did is I preached a gospel message to win the lost on the country station every Sunday morning. And the owner of the radio station said, you have got a wonderful voice for radio. He said, your voice is, is so smooth on the radio. He said, it sounds beautiful over the radio. He said, I listen to you every morning. Every Sunday morning, I listen to you. And he said, we'd like you to be a DJ on our station down in Athens, which is a new Christian radio station. Well, I went and I talked to the, I knew all the guys. I used to go down there and make my programs every week, and then they'd air them on Sunday morning. I usually taped them on Saturday. So I went down and talked to the fellow who was going to be the station manager at the new station, and he told me some things about the kind of music they were going to play, contemporary Christian, and kind of this and that, and I was not interested. I said, oh, Lord, no. If you were talking good old-fashioned southern gospel, if you were talking about a good old-timey southern gospel station, I'd be thrilled to be a DJ. But if you're talking about all that contemporary junk, I said, I don't listen to it, and I'm not about to sit for six hours a day and listen to it. So I'm, I'm not interested. Well, lo and behold, he said, well, could you do us a favor? He said, would you do a program on this station? I said, yeah, I can do that. I said, matter of fact, since this is going to be a Christian station, now, mind you, I'm the only one God, Jesus name, tongue-talking, Acts 238 preaching preacher on the entire airwaves in that entire community. The only one. And I said, well, sure, I can do a program. I said, since this is a Christian radio station, I'm going to do a teaching program. And I'm going to teach on the oneness of God. I'm going to teach on Acts 2.38. I'm going to teach on Jesus' name, baptism. And I'm going to help people understand why we apostolics believe the way that we believe. Oh, that would be great. They love the idea. So I began to produce two radio stations every week. And Dallas was with me at the time, and he, you know, he loved it. We were running between radio stations. I'd take one program up at one station on Saturday afternoon, and Sister Johnson would be with us a lot of times. Then we'd run down to the other radio station, and we would tape our other program. The first program was called The Power of Pentecost. The second program was called Feasting at His Table. And I would take my two programs, and then every Sunday morning, here they'd come on the air. I forget what time now, but let's say... I think one, the first one might have come on at 8 and the second at 8.30 or something to that effect every Sunday morning. Well, the people from Brother Davis' church, everybody was tuning in. They were thrilled that there was a Jesus name preacher on the radio in our community. People are hearing this message that we believe and that we hold so true and we, we hold it so dear. And they were thrilled out of their minds. And I'd come to church on Sunday morning and Brother Mara, oh man, was that good, brother. This morning was wonderful, Brother Mara. Oh, what a great program you had this morning. And I heard all these wonderful accolades. Now, mind you, in the process of this, Nobody's putting down Brother Davis. Just because you pat me on the back for what I do doesn't mean you're knocking him in the head for what he does. Nobody was saying to me, Gee, Brother Mara, go get yourself a storefront and we'll come to your church. You know, go get yourself a building and we'll be members of your church. That's not what people were saying. But they appreciated what I had done and what I was doing. Nobody else had been doing it. And they appreciated it and they gave me a lot of wonderful, positive feedback. Here come that green-eyed demon. All of a sudden, Brother Davis began to become very jealous. Brother Davis never did ask me to preach in his church. I had that problem a lot in churches that I was part of. Brother Gillum had me preach many times. See, that's the difference between a man that's secure and knows his place and knows his calling and somebody who is 
insecure and jealous and immature and childish. Brother Gill and I preached for on many, many occasions. And he recommended me to other churches and to tell, told them, you know, you ought to have Chuck come preach for you sometime. You know, but Brother Davis, no, he never asked me to preach. But then when Brother Davis was out of town one day, one of the brothers uh, who was an elder in the church, they asked, he had asked him to preach that Sunday. And that brother comes to me and says to me, Brother Morrow, at the end of this service, I'm going to be having an altar call, and we're going to be laying hands on people. He said, and I'm handpicking the people that I want to help me lay hands on people and pray for them, and you're one of those people. I want you there. I want you to help me. I said, okay, brother. Well, okay. Now, see, mother, I didn't have to buck Brother Davis's jealousy. I didn't have to buck the system. The Bible said, humble yourself, and in due time, you'll be exalted. If you, don't, if you don't fight it, then as time goes by, God will pick you up, and he'll put you where he wants you to be. See, David knew that he had already been anointed king over Israel. He knew that when Saul's time was up, it was David's time. But David also had enough of God in him so that he was not even remotely interested in expediting his arrival to the throne. There were opportunities that David had where he could have easily killed Saul. Now, even though Saul had tried to take his life, even though Saul hunted him like a dog, David still said no. I'll come to the throne when I come to the throne. I'll become king when I become king. But I am not, by my own hand, going to act. I'm not going to try to force the will of God and make something happen before it's time. How many of us sometimes, instead of just sitting back, we don't like the persecution of the jealous one. We don't like the persecution of the enemy. So sometimes we just really wish to God we could do something that would expedite our getting to the place, you know, where we're finally realizing everything that we owe that is, belongs to us, everything that's coming to us. But we need to learn a lesson from David because David said, no, I'll just sit and wait. It'll come to me. And when it came to him, he became the greatest king in the history of Israel, and he became the namesake, the king that the Messiah would always be referred to as the son of. Never one time is he referred to as the son of Saul. No, he's referred to as the son of David. Hallelujah. So David was willing to wait, and oh, how God exalted him. How God lifted him up to a wonderful and exalted place. I know in spirit of jealousy. It's found in Genesis 37, verses 5 through 11, and Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance in my, to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. They hated him. What was the motivation? Jealousy. People don't like the idea that you might be greater than they are. So you've got to be able to humble yourself so that I, I, I'm going to tell you honestly, uh, anybody who knows me knows this is true. I love good men. I love good, godly men. I have, I have been under preachers in my life, and how many of them have you ever heard me speak evil of and say, you know, they were no good and this and that? It doesn't work that way. I like good men. I don't care. I have, I have been friends with men like Brother Allen. 
out in East Texas. I don't agree with his doctrine. I don't agree with the way he does things. But you know what? I love the guy because he's as sincere as a heart attack. He puts all of his heart into what he does. That little fella get up there and preach and bless God. He'd preach his brains out. And he would get under the anointing. And he would let the Spirit of the Lord use him. And he would let the Spirit of the Lord move in the church. And there were times when God used me in the church service to initiate something. And they ushered in a move of God in the church service. And Brother Allen was never intimidated by that. He was never bothered by that. No, the one time that they asked me to preach in a youth service, and I spoke to the young people, and oh, the Holy Ghost came down. And the young people, there was a wonderful, oh, the, just the Spirit of the Lord was working with these young people. Well, we had kind of had an altar service in the back, you know, where they used to have the young people in the fellowship hall. But then it was time to go into the adult service, and Brother Allen asked me, Brother, would you sing? And I got up to sing, and as I began to sing, the young people began to come down to the altar, and they began to fill the altar, and they began to pray. And Brother Allen got up, and he just said, Folks, the Lord was using, he said, if you could have heard Brother Chuck in the back room this evening, he said, God was using this fella back there with these young people. He said, and as you can see, God is still moving on the young people. He said, I say, let's go with it. Hallelujah. Let's let God do whatever God wants to do. And people were praying in the altar, and they were seeking the gift of the Holy Ghost, and people were beginning to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and Dallas was in that altar that night. And I'm telling you, you see, my friend, it takes a success pure person. It takes a humble person. It takes someone who is not so uh, uncertain as to whether or not God is in charge of their life. See, if God puts you as pastor of the church, then there is no way you ought to be threatened by me. If God puts you there, you're not leaving until God takes you out. I get tired of these preachers. I, I can go into a church and I've always had a rather... Uh, for lack of a better phrase, I've always had a rather potent presence. I go into an environment. I've had people tell me, Brother Marboy, when you came through the door or when you got up and started to speak, boy, the power of God just came out and boy, we could feel the power of the Lord. And it was different than these other preachers that were there. And it was different. And you know what? You would think that that would be a good thing. But it's not. Because without fail, as quickly as I open my mouth, as quickly as the Spirit of God begins to move, as quickly as good things begin to happen. Remember the Bible said that the Spirit of the Lord was moving and Saul began to prophesy just about the time he threw his spear. So just the time God's moving is the same time that old devil is going to motivate the preacher to start throwing spears. They're going to find a way to shut you up and sit you down or do something because they don't like the fact that the people in their church are looking at you with admiration and respect. They don't like the fact that the people in that congregation never look at them that way when they preach. But see, as I say, if you're a man of God or a woman of God and you are secure in your calling, then you'll understand that God puts you there. I'm not there to unseat you. I'm not there. I'm not looking for your throne. I'm not looking for your position. I'm not trying to pester your church. I'm trying to do what God's called me to do in the short bit of time that I'm there. It reminds me of my going to uh, my district church and the Church of God years ago in my first church. And I brought some of my people with me. And the day that we organized our church, we had about 50 in attendance, including my father and Grandma Bell and quite a number of other people. And uh, after the service, Brother Huggins asked me, would you come down and preach for me tonight since you're not going to have a service this evening? I said, sure. So several of my people and myself went down to Brother Huggins' church, and I preached for him that night. And as I was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell. And I always think of that verse that uh, in the Scripture. It said, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard him. And that's exactly what happened. I was still preaching, and the Spirit of God began to fall. And people began to get up and dance in the aisles, and people began to shout, and people began to get the Holy Ghost, and things were just happening all over. The church had about 120 or 130 people. 
And the Spirit of the Lord just started moving throughout the whole congregation. And after the service, I said to Brother Huggins, Lou, I want to change, I want to trade congregations with you. I said, what a wonderful, lively, exciting group of people you've got. And he said to me, Brother Morrow, do you think they're like this for me? He said, good God, man, you brought that me. I've never seen these people do that in my life. But see, I assume that was their everyday Sunday. See, I'm not so vain, Mother, that I automatically assume all these wonderful things are immediately associated with anything I've done or anything I've said. I'm not so vain that I'm caught up that way. And neither was Brother Huggins so vain that he was intimidated by a man who could come in and bring a move of God with him, something different than anything he'd ever experienced before. And Brother Huggins said, Brother Morrow, any time you come in the church, man, you're preaching. He was from the Caribbean. So we have the story of Joseph. And his brothers grew jealous because of his dreams and the dreams suggesting that they would one day bow themselves to him and be subservient to him. And they didn't like that notion. Listen, I don't have a problem one with any preacher I meet. If he's real and he's got the anointing and the power of God on his life, I hope one day he's as big as, Billy, as Jimmy Swagger. I hope one day he's as big as Billy Graham. It doesn't hurt my feelings. If I'm not the one who realizes that type of ministry or that size of ministry, that's okay. That's all right. I can still love a guy for who he is and what, he, uh, what God has given him. I do not have to be intimidated by it. Because jealousy is a spirit. And my friend, if it's a spirit, it is something we cannot afford to buy into. The word of the Lord tells us in Matthew 13, verses 53 through 58, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Now here they're acknowledging he has a marvelous ministry. He's got great wisdom. The power of God's in his life. But because he is familiar to us, because he's from our neck of the woods and we know who mommy and daddy are, all of a sudden that's enough information to cut the legs right out of underneath every miracle he ever performed. That's enough to cut the legs out of underneath every word of wisdom he ever spoke. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know, it's interesting. He said, it, he said a prophet is not without honor, except in his own country and in his own house. We tend to think a lot of times that, we read this scripture and we think, yes, the prophet is not without honor except in his own house, amongst his own family. But the Lord first said, in his own country. And I've come to realize that that green-eyed devil we call jealousy often likes to rear its head because we're part of a common fraternity. It's all belonging to the same nation or the same country. You know, Mom, you all cops. So one cop will be jealous of another cop. Or we're all employees at this bank, so one employee can be jealous of the other employee. Or we're all ministers in the GLBT community, and therefore the bunch of these ministers will be jealous of another minister because we're all from the same country. We all share a certain commonality. And it's so interesting to me how that jealousy rears its ugly head whenever there is some commonality. You never see a person jealous. You never see a cop jealous of a nurse or a nurse jealous of a crossing guard. You see what I'm saying? 
but put people where they have something in common, and all of a sudden jealousy rears its evil head. Word of the Lord said in Matthew 23, 1 through 12, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their uh, phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. That's why the pastor doesn't have a problem if the people in the church call him Brother Morrow. That's fine. You don't have to call me Pastor Morrow. I won't be offended if you do, but it's not at all required, because we are all brethren. And then he goes on to say, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And, whatsoever, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. David was willing when Saul was operating under the influence of a spirit of jealousy, David was willing to humble himself. He didn't fight the trend. He didn't fight the wave. He didn't try to go against the grain of what was going on. No, he humbled himself. He said, well, you know what? If, if, if the best way for me to get by here, instead of trying to make myself bigger, is to make myself smaller. Instead of trying to stand out, it's trying to blend in. If that's what's going to get me through till Saul dies and it's time for me to take the throne, then that's what I'll do. I'll humble myself. Folks, we need to learn today, if we're going to keep that spirit that is uh, jealousy, if we're going to keep it at bay, we're only going to be able to do so when we have learned to humble ourselves. In the Luke chapter 14, 7 through 11, And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief room, saying unto them, When thou art bidden to any, any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. If we fight the pain, we fight God. Listen to this now. This is a good thought. If we fight the pain, we fight God. Sometimes the pain is God. Joseph's situation wasn't a good situation, but it was God. God was doing something in him. You know, Joseph could have fought that. He could have run away. I don't want to be a slave. I'll run away and hide somewhere. But no, instead he said, well, all right, this is where I'm at. I'll just be the best slave I can be. If we fight God, I mean, sorry, if we fight the pain, we fight God, and we forfeit the glory. Joseph and David both bit the bullet, so to speak, during their hard circumstances and chose instead to excel wherever they found themselves. The enemy that may enjoy keeping you down and pushing you back today may be from a common background or a common shared heritage with you, but those who are not, listen to this now, will happily recognize your gift your gifts, and reward you for your accomplishments. See, the ones that are trying to push you down are the ones in your own family. I've got preachers in the affirming community tonight that have nothing better to do than talk me down and say all kinds of evil things against me, and they go out of their way to try to make me look like a miserable so-and-so, and yet, interestingly enough, while they're doing that, there's a man in New York City who isn't even Pentecostal, who isn't even Jesus' name, who isn't even apostolic, who doesn't even like the kind of services we have because they're too 
loud and rowdy for him, but this man has pumped tens of thousands of dollars into this ministry so that we can keep preaching and doing what we're doing. Don't worry about what your family members are doing. Glory to God. They can do all they want to. There's a Potiphar out there for you somewhere. There's a Jonathan out there somewhere who's going to watch your back and who's going to look out for your step and who's going to warn you in advance when trouble's coming. Hallelujah. I've thought about Claude so many times. I thought, Lord, how in the world did you ever put Claude in my life? How did he ever find his way to become the supporter of our ministry that he's been? This man has absolutely no connection to the apostolic faith whatsoever. He visited one service in New York City. And after the service, we had a great service, at least by apostolic standards. You know, we shouted a little, had a good time. And I went to him. I figured, well, he's a black man. You know, he probably comes from a shouting church, so that shouldn't have been too foreign to him. And I said, so, brother, how would you enjoy the service? And he said, I didn't. I said, well, Lord, pick up my teeth off the ground. He just slapped me right upside the head. I said, well, gee, I'm sorry. He said, no, it's all right. He said, I, I come from a very quiet church. He said, Mine's, our, my church is Baptist, but my pastor is in his 80s, and the church isn't very vibrant and very lively. He said, I guess I've just gotten used to that. He said, so this was a little bit too loud for me and all that. He said, but he said, I'll tell you what, though. He said, I like what you're doing, and I believe in what you're doing, and I think it, we need it in our community. He said, can I help you financially, even if I don't come to your church? See, there's a Potiphar out there. My family mother can be stabbing me in the back. My brothers can be stabbing me in the back and have nothing good to say about me. But God has put Potiphar's in my path who recognize my work. They recognize, man, this guy is good at what he does. So I think I'll elevate him. I think I'll bring him up a little bit higher. I think I'll put him, I think I'll support him as he endeavors to accomplish something great. Many saints want to look on the life of others who were better liked, perhaps, than they were, or maybe even favored within the church. And that evil spirit of jealousy will flare up, causing us to want to make fun of maybe the way they got blessed or the way they prayed. You know, we visited with certain family members in recent times, and you'll hear a certain one complain about, Old sister so-and-so, and nobody in church had testified until sister so-and-so testified first, bless God. And, that, and, and if you listen real close, I'm going to tell you what you're going to hear. You're going to hear the green-eyed devil, amen. You're going to hear that green-eyed demon. There's jealousy there. If she'd have been the one that nobody testified in front of, if she'd have been the one everybody waited to speak before they dared get up and speak, then it would have been a different story. Then it wouldn't have been something to complain about. Then it wouldn't have been something to feel bad about. But because it was somebody else, that green-eyed devil shows its face. And I want to tell you today, we cannot afford, we cannot afford to allow jealousy, that green-eyed demon, to have any place in our lives. Ours is not to be jealous of another's lot or station in life, but rather it is our... Uh, purpose to find contentment within our own lot and our own station. And I close tonight with this, Philippians 4, 10 through 13, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Isn't it interesting when you read that verse in context, how all of a sudden it takes on a whole different meaning? Paul saying, whether I'm like David and I'm being put down by Saul, or whether I'm like Joseph and I'm being shoved down by his brothers, he said, whatever the situation is, or whether I'm Joseph who's at the top of the heap and second ruler in Egypt, or whether I'm David and I'm sitting on the throne of Israel, whatever the case might be, I can excel wherever I am 
I can find contentment wherever I am. Why? Because I can do it all through Christ, who gives me strength. Amen? So tonight I admonish us, there's a lot of jealousy out there, and it is trying to destroy God's church. It's trying to destroy God's work. It's trying to destroy God's people. And I just encourage us today, let's find deliverance from that demon because we don't need it in God's church. Amen. We don't need jealousy. You know, I had every intention. I'll tell you honestly. I had, matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I sent him emails and invited him uh, while I was still in New York. I was going to have this brother from Scottsdale, Arizona, come preach for me. I didn't have any negative thoughts about him. I didn't have any negative feelings.